Welcome to the Ian Khan Show. My guest today is Jerome Glenn. He's a co-founder and the CEO of the Millennium Project and the author of Social Technologies of Freedom. Jerome is a very well-known figure in the world of futurism, and I have had personal pleasure working with him on uh, some initiatives in the past. Please give a warm welcome to Jerome Glenn. Welcome to the Ian Khan Show. On today's episode, I have a big contributor to Aftershock. I have one of the world's most renowned futurists who's, who's served the industry for over 30 years is Jerome Glenn. Jerome, welcome to the Ian Khan Show. It's nice to be with you. It's such a pleasure. Jerome, you are um, one of the most renowned people when it comes to futurism. You run the Millennium Project. I have so many questions for you, and especially about your contribution to Aftershock. So Aftershock is available on Amazon. I believe it's, uh, um, it's available in different places. But uh, this book came as a result of 50 different um, influencers, futurists, uh, contributing their ideas towards what is happening in the world right now, 50 years after uh, the book uh, Future Shock uh, came, uh, came out about, about 50 years ago. And you yep. can add a lot of insight to that. Tell us, Jerome, tell us about yourself. What has brought you to, you know, to the world right now, 30 plus years into the journey as a futurist? Actually, it's closer to 45 45 years. My apologies. But who's counting? My apologies. 45 <laughs> That's right. years. That's all right. That's incredible. Um, well, I got into futures research uh, and I was doing my master's degree uh, and I was asked to help organize the futures conference and, and then the state of Vermont asked me to participate with some others to invent the future of education for Vermont and the Vermont sent me a box of Xeroxes from people, Herman Kahn and, and Bucky Fuller, people I had never heard about. And it was the most fascinating stuff I ever uh, had run into. And, and it dawned on me that these methods that futurists were using packaged vast amounts of different data and information into bite-sized pieces that you could make use to make decisions with. So I said, that's what education should also do. So I took the methods, translated those into teaching techniques, and then got a national reputation uh, in education for that. Then I went from that into general futures afterward. And so, the, you know, you, you probably have heard this question more than a billion times, I can estimate. What do you do as a futurist? And that's literally the answer. You know, people always ask, what is it that you do as a futurist? And, and quite often, uh, many people mistake a futurist for, for a profit. I mean, uh, you're, we're, you're not looking into a crystal ball and saying, you know, this is what's going to happen. You, over the last four plus decades, and I've been following your progress and, 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 and things you do at the Millennium Project through your website as well. And we've worked on, on something in the past as well together, you and I. You have a vast amount of information available, different methodologies of how to understand the future. Tell us about some of your favorite methodologies when it's about understanding tomorrow. What, are, what is the actual process that goes behind it? Maybe, maybe take one of them and, and help us understand what you do. Right. Well, the, 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 the thing that all futurists do uh, in one way or another is scanning for change. You know, it's the old story of the sea captain going into a uncharted waters hundreds of years ago and saying, somebody's got to go up the mast get up on top and look around, and see where the rocks are in the open channels. That's essentially what all futurists do. They read their little eyeballs off. They talk to different kinds of people. Uh, and the more diverse you, you have your input system, I think the better your intuition. Intuition is, to me is just a way of saying, it's too complex to explain why I came to this com conclusion because I've had all this sort of stuff. So I'll call it intuition or, yeah. you know, judgment or whatever. All right. So that's, that's, that's the common one. And, and all futures have different ways of doing it. We have an online system, a collective intelligence system that, that I use and help work and that helps me do it. Another, then, then that tells you what you should pay attention to. Uh, and then to understand the things you should pay attention to, the other technique I like is the futures wheel, where you take something like synthetic biology, which is an under recognize future force in the future in my judgment. So you could take a, a piece of paper and write synthetic biology, draw a little circle around it and say, 
Well, if that actually happens the way I think, what else will happen? Ooh, millions of new life forms. Hmm, that's interesting. New economic activities, you know, and I just come out, what are the primary consequences of that? And then what are the secondary consequences? If you have millions of new species, what else do you have? Oh, you need all kinds of regulatory environments, da, 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 da. And so you had, so you're looking out to tertiary consequences. That's the futures wheel. And it's, it's the easiest way to engage people in futures thinking. And, mm. and many futures use it in workshops when they want to move people along because everybody's good on primary consequences, but they're not so hot on second. And most people don't even look at tertiary consequences. So when they're blindsided, it's because they didn't get out to look around to the tertiary consequences. Absolutely. And thank you. It's, it's incredible. And for any of our viewers, I'm going to point them to your website, not at the end, but right now. So go to millennium-project.org. I believe that's the primary website for your work because there's an unlimited amount of ideas and content that'll help you understand what exactly happens behind the world of futurism. Now, you mentioned a few names. You mentioned Herman Kahn, of course, Alan Toffler. And I, I read your essay as well uh, in, in the book uh, uh, more than once. And tell us about that early time when the book came out, because yeah. you've written something really nice about that. Tell us when the book yeah. came out first, uh, Future Shock, and what yeah. that was all about. Well, it was 50 years ago, uh, so someone else can do the mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the thing was, uh, in those days, well, just like it was, this is basically when I started getting into it myself, just uh, in the early, early days, um, most people that, that took the future seriously, thinking about it, were science fiction writers. The average person said, man, save tomorrow for tomorrow, think about today, today, as somebody said, right? Um, so what Toffler did is that he's a really good writer, and we are jealous. I will go on the record, and I think I did in that, that chapter. He was the best writer. We fed him stuff. A lot of his stuff is not his ideas. You know, he, 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 he was a scanner. He's keeping track of a lot of people, but he was a better writer than we were. Um, and so he got the idea of taking the future seriously and continuous change seriously more than anybody in the history of ideas. And that's an extraordinary like, nice thing to say. It's a true statement that he did. Because we could go running around the world after a future shock and saying, when someone says, what do futures do? <laughs> that I could say, you heard about that book called Future Shock? And they say, oh, yes. Yeah. Well, that's what we do. <laughs> and then it says, oh, okay, now I got it. So Toffler, more than anybody else, brought the future from the domain of just science fiction writers and elite think tanks out to the general public. That's incredible. 50 years ago, there wasn't any thought process behind Not much. bringing that out of you know, yeah. where it was to, to the mainstream. Yeah, you ask somebody 50 years ago, you know, name a year in the future, and they'll say something like 3,000. In other words, yeah. like, they'll think of something beyond their lifetime. It's, it, the future is out there. It's not, yeah. It doesn't have anything to do with me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, in, in your essay as well, you've written a lot about AI, actually, artificial intelligence, which happens to be the greatest buzzword of our times right now. Everybody wants to do something with AI, but nobody knows what AI will do or how it works or what it is. Of course, you know, we live in a world full of hype, full of buzz, but then I think it's your responsibility and mine and all of ours collectively to, to eliminate the hype and to tell people the reality of it and what the actuality of things is. I want to ask yeah. you about the, you know, over the past, I would say maybe a decade or so, or if that's a good timeline, what have you seen happen? Let's talk AI. Let's make it an AI segment. What have you seen happen within AI over the last 10 years? Where are you seeing it go now? And let's talk about the future of artificial intelligence, maybe in a few different industries. But let's start from right. the past. Was AI always so buzzworthy or is this well, relatively new? Yeah. AI and um, neural networks and machine learning has been around uh, longer than 10 years. Uh, what I think uh, uh, has happened is that now we have some nice good software that makes it easy for more people to use it. Uh, the acceleration of use has skyrocketed over the last 10 years. There's no question about it. Um, and and um, 
one of the things that I think, uh, to give a nod to the World uh, uh, Environment Forum or the World Economic Forum, when they came out with that phrase, the third industrial, fourth industrial revolution, uh, what I, that helped get it out to a lot of people quickly. So the idea is you take a business from the elements of business from market research all the way to evaluation of product and sales, all those little steps. And you say, what in each step is repetitious? Well, then you put AI in all those steps. Well, people said, oh, that's cool. I understand that. So as a result, it's blossomed really fast. Um, now, um, on the, con the tremendous confusion about AI, because we don't make a distinction between three different kinds of AI. You have narrow AI, which you have right now growing like crazy. And that's the, the AI that drives a car, diagnoses cancer, but one does not do the other. They're machine learning, they're getting yep. smarter, they're doing everything everybody talks about, yep. but just for driving a car, <laughs> right? Okay. That's narrow, and that's gonna yeah. grow like crazy all over the place, yeah. assume it. Now, the next one is artificial general intelligence. Mm. That may never happen. Yeah but we think it will. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. really hard to do it. And some people say it'll take 50, 100 years. And some people say, uh -huh. you give me enough money and I can do it in five years. Yeah. In any case, there's a giant race right now between Moscow, Beijing, uh, Washington, uh, Brussels, on, and Tokyo on yeah. who's going to rule that stuff because yeah. uh, Putin came out and said, whoever runs this runs the world. Yeah. And China says, okay, that's us in 2030. Yeah. So there's yeah. a race going on. But this is yeah. the general intelligence now. General intelligence is a little bit like you in the sense that when you're confronted with a new problem, you call your friends, you do some research over here, you write a book, mm -hmm. you do Google search, you do all kinds of stuff. Well, narrow intelligence doesn't. It's in its own rule base. General intelligence does all that. It goes to the Internet of Things. Uh, yeah. It does uh, other people's AI. It, it, it's very fancy. Now, the reason that, that you hear people panicking about AI is because of the next step of AI, which we don't yeah. know how long that'll take, which yeah. is super intelligence. That's general intelligence that sets right. its own rules. That means we get left in a mess unless yeah. we get that first step of general intelligence right. Mm. And that's why it's correct to panic today yeah. about how do we to put that together, even though it won't be here for 10 to 20, 30 years. Yeah, it's right. going to take us that long to make international treaties, uh, governance systems. Uh, it, it's, 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 good. it's much more complex than atomic energy. Yeah. And we have the International Atomic Energy Agency yeah. Yeah, to monitor. Course. We don't have anything like that for general AI. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and what, what, and I completely agree. I, I also believe that there's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of chaos. There's an uneven development of technology in general, in some pockets, it's, you know, there's money being poured into it, the China's of the world and whatever areas you have. But in many places, I mean, look at the existing coronavirus as an example. We don't have, we have no idea where this virus has come from. There's no vaccines and we're struggling to, to just address this issue. Mm -hmm. so we live in a world of extreme contrasts, I believe. Um, and there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way to level uh, this plane. You mentioned three different types of AI, uh, Jerome, and you're saying that the artificial narrow intelligence is our Siri. It's our uh, solve one problem of mine. You know, the toaster, the toaster solves one problem. It toasts your toast. Uh, but then when we start getting into these systems that we see in Hollywood, in movies where complex robots are Arnold Schwarzenegger in the Terminator. Right. Is right. that artificial general intelligence or super intelligence? Well, when the, um, the robot Schwarzenegger and so from the beginning had a particular mission, right? He was going to do that. Yeah. He had general intelligence. He's going to do all this adaptation and that's, but that's general intelligence. Yeah. I think a later movie where he changes loyalty. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's super because he, mm. in other words, the original the original purpose of his general intelligence yeah. was changed by him. Yeah. All right. That's super intelligence. Excellent. There's also the movie uh, was Ex, Ex Monica. I yes. think it was a woman, right? Yeah. The yeah. woman robot, right? Yeah. All right. She cons the guys and gets out. Yeah. That's absolutely. super intelligence. They thought they were evaluating general intelligence and sure enough, she conned them and got out. That's yeah. super intelligence. Yeah. Now imagine if you do that as a metaphor for the whole civilization, 
that, that intelligence goes beyond us, sets its own rules, it could conclude that we are a problem to the environment. Mm -hmm. Knock us out. Correct. So that's Correct. where the science fiction stuff is warning us properly to say, yeah. okay, while you, before you have this general intelligence stuff, sit down, figure it out, how to do it in a good way. And that's yeah. what conferences and papers uh, all around the world is, is, is an awful lot of stuff is going on, which by the way, it's a very good sign because when internet began, I was involved in getting the packet switching in third world countries and so forth in the 80s. We were saying, isn't this going to be great? All these computers are going to be, it's going to make the world wonderful. We didn't think about child pornography. We didn't think about cyber crimes. We didn't think about information warfare. We didn't yeah. think about all of that sort of stuff. This yeah. is going to be great. Yeah. Now, fast forward to the present tense. We are taking the future seriously. I am very pleased with how many people, how many conferences, how many software is, uh, sessions are going on. The, the world is getting serious about this. They're, yeah. they're, I think we'll, we might do okay. Yeah. And I believe, uh, you know, going back 5, 10, 15, or 20 years back when the internet was, you know, 30 years ago when the internet was first commercialized and it was out there, we have a tremendous amount of scale. I mean, computing technology and microprocessors and the power that you have in today's devices is, is, is astronomically different yeah. from what it was 30 years ago. Right. And, you know, the example of the cell phone is so common when they say that your cell phone is more powerful than the computers that NASA used to send the right. first spaceship into orbit. But right. it's gone beyond that because now we're even beyond breaking the Moore's law where technology doubles every year. I think it's gone beyond that. It's quadrupling um, every single year. One of the things that's very interesting for the future, and I'd love to get your thoughts on it, is the convergence of different things, is how artificial intelligence comes together with the Internet of Things, comes together with blockchain, and this, this creates something new. This creates the tomorrow that we're looking forward to. The Tesla car being an example, which is... Um, which is a car wrapped around a computer, as they say. Can you help us understand this convergence a little bit? Yeah. Uh, there's a popular uh, movement, uh, I, you could even call it a school of futures thought, called transhumanism. Uh, and uh, they talk about the singularity. Now, the original singularity was the edge of which uh, a black hole, nothing sort of came out for the event horizon and singularity because like things coming in from here, coming in from here, coming in, becomes a one. It's a, a oneness all of a sudden. So in a sense, your, your cell phone, is, as you point out, is sort of like a oneness of a whole lot of stuff has come together into a one thing. Yeah. So if all of these things come into like a one thing, we won't be able to understand it. So however, my own feeling is when we get there, we'll understand the next thing. It, it, it's like an ongoing uh, horizon. It just keeps, yeah. <laughs> the horizon keeps going. Yeah. Um, but the idea is that human consciousness and technology will eventually, at least in our experience, will merge. Uh, so the distinction between, like, for example, am I talking to you or am I talking to a computer screen? Oh, we say we don't think of it. I mean, yes, you're talking to a computer screen, you're talking yeah. to a machine, blah, 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 blah. But I say I'm talking to you. So we have invented a sort of a psychological space of some sort between you and me, yeah. all technologically augmented, but we sort of like forget about all that technology and it's just you and me, right? right? So imagine a civilization doing that between the consciousness and technology as a whole. And I think that's the direction we'll go into mm -hmm. and how well the people involved in consciousness and how well the people involved in technology start to talk and get the thing together. So what we make is technology to enhance consciousness, make us more enlightened. And that yeah. that then feeds back to technological design. So we create a positive feedback loop. Uh, that would be nice if that happens, but we don't know if that will. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, do you have a favorite problem that you would like technology to solve that you're not seeing beings. What's what's your favorite thing? Let me that count you... the ways. <laughs> yeah, I, I I would love to hear maybe the top top three. What okay. is it that you're that you're looking forward yeah. to? Well, solve? some of the really nasty ones you just don't really want to talk about. This is the problem of ethics and futures research. You can see a, a serious, serious, serious problem, but if you talk about it in a certain way, you can create a self fulfilling prophecy in a negative way. So some things I just won't talk about, but a couple of other things. Uh, what we mentioned before 
was we need to create a global governance system. Yeah. Start working on it now because it may take t 10 to 20 years. And by that point, we might need it for general intelligence. So that's one right now. We need to do governance on that. Um, another one is as the technologies become more and more powerful and are available to more and more people, that means that an individual potentially sometime in the future acting alone could make and deploy a weapon of mass destruction and sort of f yeah, format yeah. the C drive of civilization. Yeah, well. uh, there's a th theme, as you may have noticed in science fiction, that uh, the reason we don't get contact with others is because each civilization gets so powerful that it destroys itself. Mm. Uh, so there's a race. We'll be, will we become wise enough uh, to handle this power yeah. uh, so that we don't format our C drive? Mm. Hold on. You'll have to edit this out. I'm sorry. I'll have to call you. Let me call you back. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. You can edit that out, I guess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good. All right. Oh, good. Well, in that, that case, well, oh, yeah, go, we can go ahead. How much more time you need? Five, three more, four more minutes. Good. Okay. Okay. So format the C drive. Okay, let's move on towards, uh, we've got less time now, uh, Jerome, we're towards the end of our, of our, of our, of our podcast. I want to ask you a quick question on how do we inspire the younger generations to be part of technology? How can we inspire right. others to become right. futurists or right. to learn more about technology? Well, first of all, we give equal time to solutions as we give to problems. It is immoral, in my judgment, just to keep telling people what's wrong. Mm. Because what does that do to the unconscious mind? It says yeah. we're doomed. We believe during our early days, we thought the world was going to blow up in World War mm. III. Back in the 70s, if I gave a talk like this, yeah. and you give an audience, you say, how many people we think we're going to have World War III between Moscow and Washington? Everyone says, yeah, it's inevitable. Eventually, we'll blow ourselves up. Mm -hmm. Well, that knocks out the unconscious mind of, of the humans. So I think we've got to give equal stress like, for example, people talk about the uh, global warming. We are flooded with answers. Mm. There are tons of answers out there. Mm. Are they covered? No. Mm. I mean, not much, really. You have a little tiny content. Well, you know, we had this new solar battery over here. And there, you know, there, we are flooded with answers. Yeah. We haven't even brought, there's not a global situation room on climate change solutions. It doesn't exist. Excellent. So we ha but we have global systems explaining how global warming is going to knock you out. We yeah. got that. <laughs> yeah. So focus on solutions and don't well, get both, bogged both, down. Both, both, yeah. problem yeah. and possibility. Just give equal time. Absolutely. Yeah. Because and also, you know, in our own work, we do studies on the global situation, and we can show you that we are winning more than we're losing. So there's no reason to be pessimistic. On the other hand, where we're losing is very serious. Yes. So there's no reason to go to sleep. Yes. So you got to have a balance in this. And this is how you handle the youth. You say to the youth the truth. Yeah. We're winning over here. We're losing over here. Here's a, here's a situation. We can make it. There's and and we didn't have World War Three. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a big deal. We beat the biggest trend in history. I eat I, two or more powers confront each other. They use the weapons of the day. Yeah. Well, if you apply that historic insight, we should not be alive today. Absolutely. I completely agree. Jerome, I know you've got a few different works uh, and books um, that are out in the market. Anything particular you'd like our viewers to uh, go to? Your website, again, is millennium-project.org. Um, parting words. Well, you go to the website. It'll tell you about a state of the future report. You can download. Don't need to have the hard copy. You can just download it. It costs you less money. Uh, the same thing with the work technology. We did three scenarios, and they're just really good. Some of the best scenarios I've ever done in my life are in there. Each, each scenario is about three. But each scenario is about 10 pages. It's got a lot of meat in there. It's good for you to read. Uh, and there's other stuff on the site you can take a look at. Perfect. Jerome Glenn, the legend. Thank you so much for being part of this podcast. Everybody, please check out the book Aftershock and also check out Jerome's article in there. It's really amazing. Go to Amazon, wherever you need to go to buy the book. But thank you so much, Jerome. We'll catch you another time. Have a good one and take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Hey friend, this is Ian Khan. If you liked what you saw on my video, then please subscribe to my YouTube channel and be inspired every single day with innovative content that keeps you fresh, updated, and ready for the future. For more information, also visit my website at 
iancon.com 